All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are very glad to have you at this event, Violence in Israel and Gaza, What's Going On? My name is Dorothy Noyes. I direct the Mershon Center for International Security Studies here at Ohio State. And we created this event together with several other academic units on campus, the Department of History, the Melton Center for Jewish Studies, the Middle Eastern Studies Center, and the Department of Near Eastern and South Asian Languages and Cultures. I want to thank all those colleagues for their input, and I especially want to thank the Mershon staff for putting this event together quickly at a busy time. The event has a very modest goal. In the last two weeks, we've all been inundated with heartbreaking images and frightening news. We're all uncertain about where it's going. Some of us have already faced the shattering loss of loved ones and have had no space to mourn. Many more are living in fear for the immediate future of people we care about. Even as deep traumas are made raw again, student organizations are stepping into action, organizing vigils for peace and solidarity and visibility, mobilizing for justice and support. Many others of us, however, don't have a personal connection to this explosion or specialized knowledge, and I'm one of those. Many of us don't recognize the references on the news, and we don't have much basis for evaluating the claims we're seeing online. The purpose of this very preliminary event for undergraduates is to bring in some faculty members who have been thinking for a long time about aspects of this conflict, the international and regional context of Middle East diplomacy, the ground level experience of Israelis and Palestinians, public opinion in the US and abroad, the military context and the conduct of war, and what happens to information in a crisis environment. They'll be offering some basic orientation that we hope may be useful to you in your own efforts to make sense of a terrible situation. It is not easy to establish shared facts under these volatile and polarized conditions, but it's our job as academics. We hope that it can help to lay the groundwork for the practical and ethical and political conversations that must follow at all levels. This is a panel, and I speak for myself with a lot of gray hair on it, and as many of you have noted, it represents the still limited demographic of tenured professors at Ohio State. But there's a reason we stayed with senior faculty. Even when you're trying to stick to the basics, it's difficult these days to speak in public on painful and polarized issues like this one. Those of us who are in established positions run less risk. I should say we also feel the responsibility because many of us are looking pretty hard in the mirror right now. We also turn to faculty who had specific scholarly expertise on the issues that are salient in US media. Now these are real limitations. This event doesn't include many of the voices out there and it doesn't represent your voices as students. And in focusing on the observable facts, we won't be able to give due weight to the intangibles of faith and home and memory and justice that are central for those on the ground and for many of us here at Ohio State. We won't address fully, much less resolve the ethical questions that seem most powerful for you in the audience. And fundamentally, language is just not adequate for capturing a reality of this kind. So we'll do what we can. We've got seven speakers. You have their bios in the, invent, in the event invitation, so I won't spend time on introducing them. Each will have a brief presentation between seven and 10 minutes, and then we'll go to question and answer, and we'll start with some of the questions that you posed when you registered. When you think of other questions, you can post them to the Q&A function, and I will collate them for the presenters. Uh, so we begin with Professor Peter Hahn from the Department of History, and maybe the rest of us will turn our video off. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to have been invited by Professor Noyes to address you this afternoon on the historical origins of the Israeli-Palestinian war in Gaza, ideally and with great difficulty in 10 minutes or less. I do have a Zoom presentation that I'm going to project on your screens. I believe it is there now. I'm sorry, I should say a PowerPoint presentation and, and several slides to uh, give you the outline and overview of what I intend to cover. Um, I thought it might be useful to follow a three-part survey. First, a quick overview of the history of Israel. Secondly, an equally quick overview of the history of Palestine and the Palestinian people. 
And then finally, a dissent from the peace process of the 1990s that began with great promise, uh, but quickly collapsed and descended into Israeli-Palestinian violence that has culminated tragically and recently with the outbreak of war along the Gaza border earlier this month. Regarding the history of Israel, again, a very quick overview. Israel was founded in 1948 by action of the United Nations as a haven for the Jewish people of Europe, the remnants of the Jewish people in Europe who had been traumatized by the depredations of Nazism. In its infancy, it was attacked by five neighboring Arab powers, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq, which were intent on destroying it in its cradle. Israel not only survived that onslaught, but uh, won the war militarily and ended up with more territory under its control than the UN partition plan had originally ascribed. The 1948-49 war was the first of a series of five international wars that Israel fought with its Arab state neighbors. The others came in 1956, 67, 73, and 82. Of those, the most consequential war was the 1967 war in which Israel bested the militaries of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria and occupied significant portions of their territory. As this map shows, Israel occupied at Egypt's expense both the Gaza Strip, this narrow corridor of land along the seacoast, as well as the Sinai Peninsula. From Jordan, it occupied the West Bank, and from Syria, it occupied the Golan Heights. Israel was able to secure its place in the international neighborhood through peace treaties with it, some of its Arab neighbors. The first came in 1979 when Egypt and Israel signed a peace agreement by which Egypt regained control of the Sinai, although not Gaza. And then in 1994, a peace treaty with Jordan established peace between Israel and its neighbor to the east, although Jordan did not recover and did not want to recover control of the West Bank. That was left in Jordan's mind for a Palestinian state that then seemed to be in the making. Israel continued throughout this time period to experience conflict with the Palestinian people who lived in the occupied territories, especially the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And what about the Palestinian people? The Palestinian people are those Arab Palestinians, Muslim and Christian, who had occupied Palestine for centuries uh, before the arrival of Jewish immigrants from Europe and other countries around the world. They were disheartened by the pre-World War II Jewish acquisition of land in the territory that was administratively part of the Ottoman Empire. They resisted the establishment of Israel in 1948-49, uh, with violence in concert with the neighboring Arab invading armies. Uh, they lost that effort and thereby remained sort of leaderless as a national entity for a couple of decades following the establishment of Israeli independence. Palestinians began to organize under the leadership of Yasser Arafat, who was part of the founding of a political party called Fatah, uh, which is an Arabic acronym for the Palestine National Liberation Movement founded in the late 50s. And then also Arafat took control of the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was a coalition of militant groups that had formed in opposition to Israel among the people of Palestine. Um, Arafat and his compatriots were outnumbered and outgunned by the Israelis, and so they engaged in violence, uh, a, a form of which the United States considered terrorism, uh, because it struck suddenly against civilians and other non-military assets, as well as military assets of the Israeli state. Twenty years after the occupations of the West Bank and Gaza began, the people of Palestine erupted in a widespread insurrection or uprising known as the first intifada, intifada being an Arabic word that means to shake off. The idea was they were taking to the streets 
with acts of civil disobedience and violence to try to shake off the Israeli occupations after 20 years. That first intifada of the late 80s uh, ran into the early 1990s. And of course, it featured lots of scenes like the one depicted here, a street violence between Palestinian demonstrators who were trying to challenge the authority of the Israelis to control the territories. The first intifada also developed a split between the Palestinian community. Fatah, Yasser Arafat's organization, let me back up one screen, I'm sorry. Uh, Yasser Arafat's organization drifted toward a more moderate disposition toward Israel than it had previously demonstrated. Arafat was able to sort of take control of the Intifada and direct it, but in the process established his authority as the most prominent Palestinian leader. And he began his own personal transition from militant resistor to statesman. These images on the cover of Time magazine, 20 years apart, signal how the West viewed Arafat differently after he emerged in more statesmanlike behavior. In 1988, he did recognize uh, the state of Israel having legitimacy, and he did agree, in theory, to make peace with the Israeli state, peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Arafat's emergence did enable there to be a, be a brief peace process between Israel and the Palestinians that dominated much of the 1990s. That peace process was largely facilitated by the United States, by President Bill Clinton in particular, it was the same peace process that led to the Israeli-Jordanian International Treaty. And in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian relationship, it was aimed at the proverbial two-state solution, the goal or the dream that there would emerge a state of Palestine living side by side in peace and harmony with the state of Israel, hence the two-state solution. President Clinton got Arafat and Israeli leaders very close to a settlement, inches apart from a settlement in the late 90s and in the year 2000, but he fell short. No agreement was reached. No two-state accord was accomplished. The negotiations broke down over deep disagreements on three key issues. Those issues were land, refugees, and Jerusalem. And by land, I mean the question of where the borders would be drawn between the state of Palestine and the state of Israel. Refugees meant whether those Palestinians who had been expelled from or had voluntarily fled territory that had become Israel would be entitled to a right of return, entitled to a right to their ancestral properties, or whether they would be compensated, etc. No agreement was reached on that dicey issue. And then on Jerusalem, uh, a city that was holy and powerful in the culture of both peoples, questions on who would control it, whether either state or both states would be allowed to declare it as their capital, and so forth. On those issues, on the, those specific factual issues, no agreements could be reached, and hence the peace process came to a halt. Once the peace process uh, was stymied by the year 2000, then the two communities began their descent into full-scale warfare. Uh, a second intifada, even more widespread and violent than the first, erupted in the year 2000. Uh, street scenes, again, like this one, with mobs of, of unarmed or underarmed Palestinian using stones and street fires to try to contest Israeli authorities and to bloody the Israeli people became very common. As a result of that outbreak of violence and the failure of the peace process, both the Israelis and the Palestinians drifted toward conservatism. Um, the Israeli people became more conservative in terms of their security vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, hence Israeli governments became more hawkish toward Palestinians. That was especially manifest in the last five or 10 years of Benjamin Netanyahu's leadership of the country. Netanyahu put together the most conservative government in Israeli history in 2021, and by all accounts, largely suspended his interest in compromise with the Palestinians and instead adopted a policy of rather aggressive domination of Palestinians and aggressive development of Jewish settlements on the West Bank, meaning he was diminishing the possibility of a two-state solution ever occurring. 
The Palestinians also drifted toward conservatism with a pronounced split between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, they tried to get along through a democratic process in the early 2000s, and they had elections for president and parliament as late as 2005, 2006. But then the democratic process was suspended. The two sides in, uh, engaged in a brief civil war in 2007, which basically resulted in Fatah being dominant in the West Bank and Hamas being dominant in Gaza. Generally speaking, Fatah still willing in principle to make peace on the grounds of a two-state solution. Hamas still committed to the destruction of Israel. And then finally, um, that set the stage for the descent into cyclical warfare between Israel and Hamas, Hamas again being dominant in the Gaza Strip. There were outbreaks of border violence in March 2008, and then notable outbreaks in December 2008 into January 2009, again in November 2012, again in the summer of 2014, smaller outbreaks in 2018 and 2021, and the granddaddy outbreak of earlier this month, October 2023. Generally, these outbreaks of violence involved Hamas firing rockets across the border from Gaza into Israel proper, Israel trying to defend against those rockets with its Iron Dome security shield that's illustrated in the photo on the left, and then Israel also trying to deter or render impossible future Hamas attacks by pummeling uh, Gaza from the air with airstrikes targeted toward taking down Hamas leadership and command and control, but also levying vast civilian casualties and costs on the Palestinian people of Gaza. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hahn. Uh, we now turn to Professor Ori Yehudai, also of the Department of History. So thank you for organizing this webinar and for uh, inviting me. Um, there is some overlap between my uh, presentation and Professor Hans' presentation because we're discussing the same history, but I think the uh, framing and the context are and the context are a bit different. So, uh, uh, so I'm talking about uh, my topic is coexistence since uh, 1948, since the creation of Israel in 1948, and 1948 is really uh, and indeed uh, uh, an appropriate starting point. It's the most crucial moment in the history of Israeli-Palestinian relations. It also symbolizes the complexity of the conflict. The 1948 war, uh, as we learned, uh, led to the establishment of Israel as an independent state and to Palestinian defeat and the displacement of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who uh, fled or were expelled uh, by Jewish forces during uh, the war. So for Israelis, 1948 um, was the war of independence and for Palestinians, uh, the 1948 war uh, is known as the Nakba or catastrophe. Um, but to understand 1948 and also what happened uh, later, we have to take a brief step, uh, 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 take a brief step, step back to the beginning of the conflict in the late 19th uh, century, when the Zionist movement uh, was established in Europe. Uh, Europe had started organizing Jewish immigration and settlement in Palestine. The goal of the movement was to uh, create a, a national home for the Jews in their homeland in Palestine. Um, it, the movement was created largely in response to anti-Semitism in Europe, and it built on the uh, historical, religious, and emotional connections of Jews uh, between Jew the Jewish people and the land of Israel. But the settlement of Jews on the land in many cases led to the dispossession and removal of Palestinians. The Palestinians resisted, often violently, and created their own nationalist movement, uh, which was determined to fight against Zionism. Uh, this conflict, as, Peter Hahn, as, as Professor Hahn explained, uh, started when Palestine was under, under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, and then it escalated uh, under uh, British uh, rule, which started under the, after the, the, the First World War. And this is why the British departed in 1947. This is why they left Palestine in 1947, because of their inability to control uh, 
the violence. During those years, the Palestinians felt threatened by growing waves of Jewish immigration to Palestine, and they urged the British to stop immigration. It's also important to note that most Jews went to Palestine not because of Zionist ideology, not because of ideological convictions, but because they escaped anti-Semitism um, or economic hardships in their home countries. And this pattern culminated in 1948. One of the main reasons uh, why the international community decided to create a Jewish state in Palestine alongside an Arab state in 1947 was the need to give a new home to Jewish Holocaust survivors who were unwanted in uh, other countries. And Israel indeed became the main refuge for hundreds of thousands of survivors of the Nazi genocide and also for Jews who had been displaced from their uh, countries in the Middle East. But this process involved the displacement of around 700,000 Palestinians who were the victims not only of Zionist policies, but also of the victimization of Jews in other countries. So this is an important pattern of the history of the conflict. Now, the main turning point after 1948, uh, which uh, uh, Professor Hahn uh, presented, was the 1967 war when Israel occupied uh, the territories that uh, we saw earlier uh, on the map. The 1967 war was a crucial moment in the conflict. It marked the beginning of Israeli occupation of territories that should form the basis of a Palestinian state. After 1967, Israel also started building settlements in those territories with the purpose of preventing a Palestinian state. The occupation and the settlements are a colossal historical mistake. The settlements are a major, became a major obstacle to peace. Israel poured money and resources into the settlements, which and the settlements also produced the most radical right-wing religious elements in Israeli society. In the 1990s, uh, as we saw, there was a peace uh, process, a diplomatic uh, process uh, that uh, uh, failed uh, and erupted in the violence of the, uh, um, and which led to the eruption of violence of the, of the Second Intifada in 2000. Um, and as we saw also one of the outcomes of the Second Intifada was the Israeli decision to pull out of the Gaza Strip in 2005, although even after pulling out of the area, uh, it imposed a blockade uh, on the Gaza Strip as a reaction to the rise of Hamas uh, to power uh, there. Um, and then since 2000, there have been several failed attempts to revive the process and the West Bank is still under Israeli occupation. Um, so Professor Hahn mentioned some of the, the reasons for the failure of, uh, of negotiations. Um, I want to say that uh, for coexistence to succeed, both sides must accept the, the right of the other to live in dignity and security. Um, so beyond the details um, um, and the various problems and issues that have to, that have to be uh, resolved, uh, both sides have to accept the, the legitimacy um, and the right of the other side to live in dignity and security. Israel should end the blockade on Gaza and end the occupation of the West Bank. The Palestinians must accept Israel's permanent presence in the Middle East. And I think that currently this seems unli unlikely, unfortunately. I want to add that I'm deeply worried that the conflict turns into a genocidal conflict. Experts describe both the Hamas attack on Israel's south and the Israeli bombing of Gaza as acts of genocide or proto-genocide. In Israel, there are voices calling to wipe out Gaza. The Hamas atrocities demonstrated how this organization intends to conduct its struggle against Israel. And the violence taking place now also brings up collective traumas on both sides. 
The sadistic massacre that Hamas uh, conducted reminded many Jews throughout the world of the murder of helpless Jews during the Holocaust. The comparison is historically inaccurate, but collective memories and fears cannot be denied. The mass displacement of Palestinians from North Gaza taking place now surely brings memories of the Nakba, of the displacement of 1948, and fears that the Palestinians would not be able, not be allowed to return, as happened in 1948. Peaceful coexistence requires that both, both sides abandon the fantasy of getting rid of the other. Israelis should realize that a society that aspires to annihilate its neighbors loses its legitimacy and humanity. And those who describe Israel as a colonial entity, in my opinion, engage in an unproductive discourse because they miss the complexities of this history and they help nurture the fantasy that Israelis will someday live um, just like European colonists left the countries they were colonizing. A distinction should be made in that context between occupied territories and Israel proper. And describing the massacre of Israelis as an act of anti-colonial liberation, as some people do, can be perceived as an implicit condoning of crimes against humanity. For coexistence to be possible, also among people living outside Israel and Palestine, I want to encourage all of us to make a little room, a little space in our hearts for the suffering of the other, even as we are heartbroken. And although I cannot end in an optimistic note, because I'm not uh, optimistic, I want to present three different cases from the history of the uh, conflict um, that perhaps may help us reflect on the current moment. So the first, the first case, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Han presented, uh, was the first Intifada, which was the first, the, the uh, a significant Palestinian popular uprising against the occupation. This was a mostly nonviolent uprising, and it was one of the main factors leading to negotiations, to a diplomatic process, to a peace process, um, of the 1990s. So uh, nonviolent uprising led to peace process, which as we know failed, but still uh, uh, provided the opportunity. The second example is the second intifada, which erupted after the failure of the peace process of the 1990s, uh, which was much more violent um, and led to more violence. And as presented earlier to the rise of more conser conservative views, and to the decline of the, the, what is called the Israeli peace camp, to the camp, political camp in Israel that supported uh, a, a political uh, solution. So uh, a violent, more, a va more violent resistance led to uh, the decline of the peace camp in Israel. And then finally, the final example, the 1973 Yom Kippur War or October War, which was fought between Israel um, and uh, Egypt and Syria. Um, many have made comparisons between the Hamas attack of October 7th and the 1973 war, because in both cases the Israeli army uh, was, uh, was caught off guard, was surprised by the attackers. But the important point here is that, that, is that the 1973 war eventually led to a peace process and to a peace agreement between uh, Israel and Egypt. So here we have a case of a war that eventually led to a uh, peace a uh, peace uh, treaty. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so uh, I just want us to reflect on the uh, 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 meaning of those events uh, and their consequences as we are uh, thinking about the current moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yehudai. Our next speaker is Joy McCorriston from the Department of Anthropology. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you to both you, Peter Hahn, and my colleague and friend, Ori Yehudai, for providing um, an important background 
I want to start off in the limited time that we have together to, by saying, I come from the Department of Anthropology. I'm an anthropologist, and I think it's important for me to start here. Being an anthropologist means that when you approach a cultural group or an issue that's deeply important to one, you start from your own position. You start uh, as a person self-reflective. Think about how your own experience affects how you observe other people. So rather than represent Palestinians, which I don't and can't do, I am not Palestinian. I am not even um, an, anthrop a, 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 an ethnographer. But what I uh, would like to do today is to share some of my ground level experiences with Palestinians in the Middle East. Um, I am reaching back before October 7th, 2023 or 2006, or 1987, uh, or, um, or 1982 for that matter, some of the dates you've heard about. And what I hope to do is to share with you a smattering of the diversity of Palestinian voices to help Americans, one, understand the conflict, and two, recognize Palestinian humanity and experiences since 1948. So my first encounter with Palestinians was in Jerusalem in 1979. I'm an archeologist. I joined an archeological dig in Israel. I was 17 years old. And when my um, colleagues had left on their flights and my flight was coming up in a few days, um, a Jerusalem taxi driver, a Palestinian man, a family man named Mohammed, recognized me as a young girl too far from home. And he took me home to stay with his family, to meet his wife and daughters. Um, they welcomed me. It was Ramadan. Um, I stayed up all night and, and feasted with the family. I remember the drums in the streets of East Jerusalem, the feasting, the gathering of people, the welcome that I received from the wider family. And when the time came, um, Mohammed drove me to Lod Airport. And on that trip, uh, we were stopped by Israeli soldiers. And I saw Mohammed um, harassed, shouted at, humiliated, uh, humbled. And this was outside my personal experience. I had not been stopped when I toured Israel or the occupied West Bank. Um, I had been welcomed everywhere. And it was pretty shocking to me and got me thinking about justice and curious about Palestinian experience. While I was still quite young, I focused on archaeology in Jordan and Syria. And in Syria, a Palestinian Syrian Christian family adopted me in the year I lived in Damascus, and I stayed very close to them for decades thereafter. Michelle Awad, the father of the family, was from Yaffa. It was an Arab port city outside modern Tel Aviv. He showed me the keys to his home and the family Bible he carried from his burning house. He fled with his aged mother on his young back because a Jewish terrorist unit had threatened his life and set fire to his home. Now that would have been the late 1940s, a period we've heard about historically, um, and which I had an experience of knowing someone who um, experienced those consequences and lived the rest of his life in Damascus. This was a period when Jewish and ter Arab terrorist groups were attacking civilians in this landscape. I could tell you more of my own observations, but instead, I'm going to urge you to listen for diverse Palestinian voices, diverse Palestinian voices. Build your own experiences and your own listening. We have some very significant Palestinian voices on campus this year. Right now, in the Wexner Center for the Arts, Jumana Mana is an American Palestinian artist in residence. And only a few days ago, I saw her very evocative film, Foragers, about second class Israeli Palestinians denied the right to forage traditional foods in their natal villages and lands. Their voices are on the film with good translations so you can follow along. 
Uh, there are several more showings of this film in November, so you can hear those Palestinian voices. In the spring, we'll have a visit from Adania Shibli, who is a prize-winning Palestinian author of minor detail, uh, and one of her several novels. She will be reading in undergraduate classrooms and at a public event, so watch for her. And if you are looking today for diverse voices that you can read and hear through their works, I'll just mention a few. Uh, Raja Shehada is a Palestinian author and human rights activist uh, in Ramallah. His book, Palestinian Walks, which I have read, describes the narrowing circuit of hiking and walking paths available to him under Israeli occupation throughout his lifetime as his access to natural places that he has loved has been increasingly cut off and constrained. Misha, <clears throat> sorry, Misha Hiller's Sabra Zoo describes the experience of a Palestinian teenager entering the Sabra and Shatila camps after Israeli allied phalangists massacred civilians in 1982 in Lebanon. I knew Misha when he, just after he arrived from Lebanon, where he'd been a volunteer medic on one of the ambulances into Sabra and Shatila. His is, a, is an important voice. Um, a final word about the current conflict. As you are hearing, history and context doesn't start on October 7th, 2023. If you should want to know more from an anthropological point of view, I teach archaeology in the Holy Land here at The Ohio State University. I start with the first people in the Holy Land who are arrived 800,000 years ago and aren't really people. They were Homo erectus, uh, an ancestral hominid. Archaeology shows us that through time, the Holy Land has always been a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual place with shifting sovereignties. And it also shows us through archeology span and history that fully Jewish sovereignty before the modern era was about 90 years long. The Crusaders established Frankish kingdoms that lasted for 200 years. So there has been a long, a history of different sovereignties in this contested landscape. So if you're interested, come and take the course and bring your perspectives so that we can continue conversation in the classroom. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor McRiston. We turn now to Professor Johanna Selman, who is from the Department of Near Eastern and South Asian Languages and Cultures. Thank you so much, Professor Noyes, and thank you to all the previous presenters and to everybody who arrived today. Uh, my name is Johanna Selman. I teach Arabic literature in the Department of Near Eastern and South Asian Languages and Cultures. Today, I'm going to speak about some key concepts relating to Palestinian rights, relationship to territory and dispossession, and briefly reflect on the question of how they are mediated in Palestinian culture, literature, and art. The topics I address today are non-comprehensive, um, just in just a few minutes, um, but I hope to provide something that is useful to you. Um, and about the question of representation, um, I'm not Palestinian. Um, I am a scholar and teacher of Arabic literature and migration, working with undergraduate students and graduate students here at OSU. And I echo Professor McCorriston's um, call to listen to diverse uh, Palestinian voices and listen to diverse Israeli voices in, the, in this, in this um, ongoing conflict. And I, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Did everybody see that? Okay. Here we go. I want to start with a quote by Leila Farsakh, who's a political economist. Leila Farsakh writes, at the heart of the Palestinian struggle is a yearning to return home and for freedom. Over the past 
75 years, this yearning for return home and freedom has remained a constant in Palestinian cultural production, even as it has been interpreted and expressed in many different ways. Palestinians as a nation in a state of exile have dreamed of and struggled to enact return in different ways. These practices and their expression in literature, art, and film have become important political and cultural references in the Arabic speaking region. And for a nation without a state, culture and arts have taken on particular, a particular importance. Go ahead and share again. Um, The displacement that lies at the root of this yearning for return and restitution is the event known in Arabic as a Nakba. A Nakba in Arabic means the catastrophe and refers to the massive displacement of Palestinians that took place when the Israeli state was founded in 1948. Fighting and circulating news of massacres caused about 700,000 Palestinians to leave for the West to leave for the West Bank, as you see here in this map of migration, um, the Gaza Strip and neighboring Arab countries and even other countries. When the war was over, about 150,000 Palestinians remained in the new state of Israel and those who had been displaced were prevented from returning to their homes. In other words, in the very brief period over the period of the years 1947 to 1949, over 90% of the population had been forced out of their homes and over 80% had become refugees. Although the United Nations declared in Resolution 196 that Palestinian refugees should have the right of return at the earliest possible date, this has yet to be realized. And just a note on the definition of refugee, UNRWA, the UN agency that works with Palestinian refugees, defines a Palestinian refugee as someone who was displaced in the fighting between 1947 and 1949, as well as their descendants. And this doesn't encompass everyone who was forcefully displaced in, um, in further conflicts that our colleagues have elaborated on. The vast majority of Gazan today, for example, are descendants of refugees from 19, 1948, mostly from the south of um, the areas around, around Gaza, from the south of Israel, the areas that were targeted in the attack of, on October 7th. Um, many Palestinians, um, as was previously mentioned, held on to the keys to their homes, um, and these keys became and remain a prominent symbol of the Nakba in, in art. So here are just a couple of examples of um, this image of, of the key. Over time, Palestinian communities have experienced several major additional displacements and types of dispossession, prompting many to speak of an ongoing Nakba, thus not limiting the Nakba to the events that took place 75, 75 years ago. And we've seen a few different maps here. So this is the map um, of the Oslo Agreement, um, which was intended to transfer uh, transfer all of these ter this entire area of the West Bank um, into Palestinian sovereignty. Um, but we see here that the that there's areas A's and B's where some there's some limited Palestinian sovereignty, that there's no contiguous state of land. This map does not show the settlements um, in area C that so many of our colleagues um, spoke spoke about. I want to talk uh, about a few additional a, a few additional terms that are important. So one of them is exile. Um, today, about half of Palestinians live in exile or diaspora, that is outside of the area that was some people call historic Palestine or the British Mandate Palestine, so Palestine before 1948. About half of Palestinians in diaspora or in exile are stateless, meaning they don't have citizenship in their country of residence. Exile or manfa in Arabic is a term linked to loss and negation. Palestinian American critic and scholar Edward Said defined exile as, and I quote here, an unhealable rift forced between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home, in its true home, end quote. The project of return can be understood as an effort to heal this rift. Palestinian artists and writers living in exile or diaspora have had a profound impact on literature and arts in the Arabic speaking region. For example, in the decades following the Nakba, Palestinian writers were in the role of a literary and artistic vanguard in their exilic locations, embodying the critical distance to political power that was central to the conception of the intellectual at the time, and often leading the way in artistic experimentation and literary innovation. 
Today, Palestinian cultural actors work from across Palestine, Berlin, New York, um, and many, many other nodes in a larger network addressing these, addressing these questions. Another key concept and practice in Palestinian quest for return is and, and freedom is resistance. It was Palestinian writer Ghassan Kenethani who first coined and defined the concept of resistance literature, a concept that has since been applied to a number of post of colonial and post-colonial contexts in the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa. Kenethani originally used the term in 1966 to refer to the poetry and Arab language, Arabic language journalism by Palestinians in Israel that asserted their presence and identity in the face of cultural erasure and land confiscations. In the late 1960s, the term resistance literature became linked to, um, to, to, to an armed struggle against occupation. Perhaps most prominently, the idea of resistance has been nestled with the concept of sumud, a term that si signifies steadfastness, resilience, patience, and cultural survival, including the practice of remaining in place. Lale Khalili, a scholar of Palestinian cultural memory, has noted that sumud is linked specifically to daily acts of survival privileging the everyday over heroic narratives and also privileging, privileging a long-term vision of justice. Today, in the absence of a state or unified territory to return to, the Palestinian nation is fragmented and scattered in geography, yet continues to assert its presence and shared struggles and identities. Even if there are divides in regard to how return and freedom are to be achieved, this yearning continues to be an organizing principle and literature, arts, and cinema continue to be central media spaces of deliberation for these, for these crucial questions, including the questions of what a, um, politi what, what a polit political solution might look like, a political solution in, in which everyone who is connected to the land can live in, in, in dignity, um, and also the question of what stands in the way of that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Zellman. We now turn to Professor Christopher Jelpi of the Department of Political Science. Hi, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, my research uh, expertise is on uh, American public opinion and foreign policy. So I'm gonna share with you uh, some uh, recent data about how the publics in uh, the United States, as well as in Israel and Palestine, uh, well, particularly in Gaza, are responding to the conflict. Um, and I think there are kind of some surprising uh, results on uh, uh, on each front. So I'm gonna share my screen um, with you here and hopefully you'll be able to see that. And there. Um, so, um, uh, first of all, looking on uh, the U.S. side, I think the the thing that uh, strikes me the most uh, that I've seen in the response to the October 7th attacks is uh, a move towards a bipartisan support for Israel uh, within the United States. Uh, it may be surprising to some folks to know that um, earlier this year, in March of this year, for example, uh, there was a, there was a very sharp uh, partisan divide on attitudes towards Israel, with uh, Democrats actually uh, expressing slightly more sympathy for the Palestinians uh, than for the Israelis in this conflict. Um, and we can see here in the second set of uh, bars there that that has gone away after um, after the October seventh attacks. We see. Uh, movement toward uh, significant movement toward more support for Israel, especially among Democrats, although across the board uh, for um, for Republicans and independents as well. We see the American public shifting, uh, shifting to Israel. Uh, the one real uh, exception to that, I think, in terms of the divide, and we're used to talking in American politics these days, we're used to talking about a partisan divide. And here, I think that there actually isn't so much a partisan divide as there is a generational divide. And that may not be too surprising to some of the folks uh, participating in the webinar here. Uh, but you can see in the uh, the third set of columns from the left there where it divides uh, by age. And this is uh, data from YouGov, the same polls I just showed you. Um, you can see that uh, among those over 65, 
we have about 62% support for uh, the Israelis over the Palestinians, whereas that drops to about 35% for those 18 to 29. Um, and really 18 to 29 year olds are the, the only segment of the population where we see significantly higher active support for the Palestinian cause. So on the American side, we're moving away from a partisan divide, which is what we're used to seeing these days on most political issues, and really toward a, a generational divide in terms of uh, taking sides in this conflict. Um, however, I do think that overall, uh, there's quite a bit of support for um, military aid to Israel and um and uh, to Ukraine, and I connected here to Ukraine because of the speech that President Biden gave the other day, where he explicitly said that he was going to package together aid for Ukraine, military aid for Ukraine with military aid for uh, for Israel. And you can see in that top set of results here uh, from another national U.S. poll that um, that uh, President Biden had shopped his message around pretty carefully because he seems to have hit a, a uniquely strong uh, moment of bipartisan support where you basically have 70 percent of both Democrats and Republicans saying that they support this package of aid to uh, both uh, to both Ukraine and to Israel, which I think is where you're likely to see American policy shift. Um, but even as you see in the, the numbers below, if we just ask about um, providing military aid to support Israel, uh, you still see very broad um, public support for that aid. Um, although there you do see a little bit more of a partisan divide with Democrats a little bit less uh, less supportive. But all in all, I think it's pretty clear that the American public is uh, shifting along with the American leadership into a, um, a pro-Israel position on, uh, on the conflict here. Um, shifting to uh, thinking about uh, public opinion within Gaza, uh, this is specifically polling um, within Gaza done by a Palestinian polling or organization. Um, one of the themes that we often hear about uh, in terms of uh, fighting this conflict is a strong distinction that is drawn between uh, Hamas and the Palestinian people. Um, and we heard, for example, um, uh, President Biden talking about how uh, uh, Hamas was not representative of the Palestinian people. And um, it turns out that uh, if you actually ask the people of Gaza what organizations they support, uh, there's quite a bit of support for Hamas uh, among residents of Gaza. Um, the, Hamas is the uh, far left-hand column there in the um, uh, in the graphic, where you can see you have about 58% of Gazans saying they su they support um, Hamas. Uh, moreover, if you ask about other groups. Uh, like uh, Islamic Jihad, which is PIJ, that's the middle column there, um, you see even stronger support among Gazans for uh, those sorts of groups or uh, new groups like the Lion's Den, which is the second from the right uh, column. Um, so I, I think there's we need to face the reality that there is quite a bit of popular support for violent armed resistance within Gaza. Um, this is not necessarily to place blame for why people do or don't support those views, but rather to um, to point out this sort of idea that one can um, get rid of Hamas and uh, and just have the Palestinian, you know, then then the rightful Palestinian people will have the policies that they want. I think is a little bit naive in terms of. Uh, in terms of how to think about this conflict and also how to think about what what are really plausible solutions for this conflict, because um, Hamas is the, the distance between Hamas and uh, the opinions of the people of Gaza is not as far as uh, some of our leaders might want us to think. Um, finally, turning to uh, the Israeli side in terms of how the Israeli public has reacted to uh, the October 7th attacks. Here again, I think we find some surprises, as at least surprising to me, as we did uh, in the United States and um, in Gaza. Um, we do uh, perhaps not surprisingly see uh, high levels of Israeli support for ground invasion of Gaza, about 65%, although that's not as high as 
one might have expected. And if you compare this, for example, I've heard references to this is an Israeli 9-11, which I think is probably not a great analogy. But um, if you do compare it to 9-11, you see that uh, the Israeli public response for the use of force here is much more measured than uh, the American response was after 9-11. Uh, Moreover, unlike um, George W. Bush, who received a huge rally around the flag uh, effect after 9-11, uh, we do not see any uh, rally around the flag for uh, Netanyahu. And in fact, his, um, I mean, his popularity was already quite low in, uh, in Israel, but it dropped another 10 points after, um, after the attack. And instead what we see is a strong shift toward Gantz and the National Unity Party, um, and uh, which jumped uh, over uh, about twelve points after the attack. So the Israeli the the, the Israeli public is um, uh, is supportive of using force, but more cautious than we might expect, and. Um, uh, that there has not been, as was mentioned before, there has not been a shift to the right uh, among Israeli public opinion following this attack, which is something that we saw after a lot of other um, uh, attacks on Israel. Um, but there is uh, strong support for the unity government and, and uh, for com confronting Hamas overall. Uh, the last um, point I wanted to make is sort of a sad one about what comes next, and that is that the one thing that I think that we can say that the, the uh, Palestinian and Israeli publics agree on is that they do not have any faith in uh, the two-state solution. So we see support for the two-state solution um, dropping both in Israel and Palestine to uh, well less than uh, majority support, about 24% among Palestinians and 35% among Israelis. Uh, the biggest drop is among Arab Israelis. So uh, it, that, that I think leaves me very um, concerned about where both the Israeli and Palestinian publics are in terms of what could be solutions to this conflict. And with that, I will end there. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Delpy. And we now turn to Professor Peter Mansour from the Department of History. Well, good afternoon. I, we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot this afternoon, and I hope you are too. I'm going to address the, the military aspects of the conflict, since that's my, my specialty area. Uh, the Israelis have... Uh, liken this attack to their 9-11. Um, what do they mean by that? Well, it, it was a surprise to them, not that uh, Hamas would attack them, because Hamas had been t attacking them for, for years, uh, but the methods that they used to penetrate the border wall, to get over it with paragliders, and get significant numbers of, uh, of their forces into Israel was a surprise. And then they're referring to uh, the terrorist methods that Hamas will use. Now, I, I'm reading the, the question and answer, and terrorist is a loaded term, I know. So I'm not going to go to the goals of Hamas and call them uh, one thing or another. But the methods that they used uh, were terrorist, in that you're targeting non-combatants deliberately in order to create a shock effect on world opinion, which is exactly what happened. Um, 1,400 Israelis killed, 3,300 injured, and uh, perhaps even more importantly, 220 taken hostage and taken back into Gaza, where they're now uh, hidden away. And this has created a national security crisis in, in Israel. So Israel has um, a revenge motive here, uh, both to strike back at Hamas uh, in previous episodes where they've uh, entered the Gaza Strip and bombed, it was to reestablish deterrence. They, Israeli leaders call this mowing the grass, right? You go in periodically, you destroy some buildings, you destroy some of the leadership, you kill some of the leadership. You may go in every now and then with a ground incursion. You don't stay for very long. You've reestablished deterrence. You've uh, reduced Hamas's military capabilities but then you leave and things go back to some sort of stasis and uh, deterrence has been reestablished. Um, this is different. 
uh, when revenge is the motive now, uh, reestablishing deterrence uh, takes a second place behind uh, what the Israeli government has determined is their new mission, and that is to destroy Hamas. Now, I will get back to this mission at the tail end of, of my remarks, but let me just say that this is probably a, a bridge too far for the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, as Professor Jelpe noted, Hamas is deeply embedded uh, within Gazan society. Uh, it's too easy for the militants to hide among the, the civilian population where they receive support. And um, I don't think it's possible for Israel to accomplish this mission. And if even if it is, it's going to take months of combat to do it uh, with uh, untold numbers of, uh, of people killed in the, in the interim. Um, so what will this look like? I think that Israel is preparing a ground invasion. That's pretty clear. They've said so. Uh, what we're seeing now are airstrikes to uh, the military term is shape the battlefield. Uh, if you you probably don't recall the 1991 Gulf War, but if you read about it, there were six weeks of airstrikes before U.S. and coalition forces invaded Kuwait uh, uh, to liberate that country from Iraqi forces. And what, what those six weeks of airstrikes did is they reduced uh, the capabilities of the defending Iraqi forces, the Republican Guard particularly, by destroying armored vehicles and uh, supply caches and so forth. So what I think we're seeing here is the Israeli Air Force is targeting uh, Hamas leadership, Hamas supply nodes, tunnels, um, uh, their rocket systems, anything that they can target in order to reduce Hamas's military capabilities so that when a ground invasion does occur, the ground forces will take fewer casualties. But in the meantime, the numbers of civilians killed in the, that bombing uh, continues to increase at uh, latest count, 5,000 Gazans killed and 15,000 injured. Um, now, the laws of war apply to this conflict. The Hamas has clearly violated them because of their deliberate targeting of non-combatants. Um, Israel is, is a, a more nuanced story because the laws of war don't say you can't kill non-combatants. What the laws of war state is that the numbers of non-combatants killed have to be commensurate with the military advantage gained in the process. Um, and this is a hard calculation. And one side might view it very differently from the other side, will obviously view it very differently from the other side. Um, and these are calculations that can only be made at the highest levels of, uh, of, of the political uh, leadership. Um, so we'll see as we go forward what the Israelis are willing to commit and what world opinion uh, is, uh, how world, world opinion responds. Uh, right now, the Bush, or the, I'm sorry, the, the Biden administration is saying Israel, we have Israel's back, you know, we support them fully, but as the bodies continue to pile up, we'll see. And there may be great pressure to bring this war to a conclusion. And it would be an unsuccessful conclusion in the Israeli viewpoint, unless Hamas is eliminated, which is they've stated is their mission. <clears throat> um, the, the big thing uh, here, though, and this goes back to the 9-11 comparison, and I've written about this in the LA Times and, uh, on, and I've spoken about it at various media outlets, MSNBC and CNN, is what happens the day after, right? So in 9-11, after that attack, the Bush administration was clear we were gonna go into Afghanistan, we were gonna mm -hmm. destroy, defeat the Taliban, and we were going to uh, destroy Al-Qaeda. Al uh, they were able to defeat the Taliban and kick the Taliban and Al-Qaeda out of the country, cross the border into Pakistan, uh, but then what? Before the war actually started, before the ground operations actually started, President Bush was in a meeting of his war cabinet. He looked around the table and he said, so who is going to govern Afghanistan after we win? And he got a bunch of blank stares back at him from the table. They didn't know. And as a result, 
what happened in Afghanistan was we went from one expediency to the next. And uh, 20 years later, we got kicked out of the country or we left voluntarily. And ne nevertheless, the Taliban is there now. And the government we installed is not. Israel needs to think about the same thing here. Even if they're successful, who's going to govern Gaza? Can't be the Israelis. Um, the United Nations may, may want no part of it. Uh, and the Palestinians, well, they would just support Hamas coming back in. So this is the primary question is, what is the goal? And if it is to destroy Hamas, what comes next? Um, I'll leave you with this vignette. Uh, when I retired from the military in 2008, I, I retired as a full colonel. I was General Petraeus's executive officer during the Iraq war. Um, and so I had a lot of experience. I was a brigade commander in Baghdad. I had a lot of experience fighting uh, counterinsurgency battles. And so the Israelis invited me over in uh, the end of fall of 2008 to kind of pick my brain on what had happened in Iraq and, you know, how did you succeed uh, in during the surge in 2007, 2008. And the number one lesson I gave them was you have to find willing partners on the other side. You don't make peace with your friends. They're already your friends. You make peace with your enemies. And so for us, that was the awakening movement and embracing the, the tribal revolt against Al-Qaeda and searching for insurgent groups that were willing to give up uh, fighting in order to embrace a political solution for the way ahead. I said, you need to find those people on the Palestinian side. And to a to a person, this was mostly a room full of Israeli Defense Force officers. They're like, well, that's not possible with the Palestinians. What else do you have for us? And I just shook my head and I'm like, if you're going to ignore the number one lesson of, uh, of how we succeeded, at least in that time period in Iraq, you're going to get nowhere in this conflict. And I think that kind of sums it up. The Israelis have gotten nowhere except for mowing the grass. And that strategy has come to uh, its conclusion. Something else has to has to follow now, and I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Professor Mansour. We conclude with Professor Kelly Garrett from Communication. Right. Uh, thank you so much. I learned a lot in this uh, presentation this afternoon, and I will try and keep my comments brief so that we have at least a little bit of time for questions. Uh, as was said, my name is Kelly Garrett. I'm uh, the director of the School of Communication, I'm a professor there. And my research focuses on how the online information environment shapes what people believe and contributes to misperceptions. My goals today are threefold. I want to provide a brief overview of the way that communication occurs during a conflict. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about mis- and disinformation, including what it is, how we define it, that is, where it comes from, why it exists. And I will end with a few strategies that you can use to both guard against your own potential misperceptions and help respond to misinformation when you see it. So the first thing that I would say about communication during a conflict. It is an incredibly complex process to try and understand what's happening during a uh, conflict in a war zone. You, you know that you're going to have an incomplete picture. You know there's going to be distortion. There will be pieces that are left out, pieces that are reflected wrong. Um, in this particular conflict, we have uh, clear difficulties with uh, professional journalists having very limited access into Gaza. There are some in the country, but they are limited. At the same time, we have individuals who don't have a background in journalism with an unprecedented ability to capture and share information in near real time, thanks to technologies like mobile phones, smartphones, and social media, and the internet, and so forth. This creates a complicated tension because on the one hand, these are invaluable sources of information, a glimpse into what's going on in a world that would otherwise be impossible for most of us to see. On the other hand, there is a tsunami of information, some of which is verifiable and accurate, others which is very difficult to verify, some of which is uh, a best attempt to represent the truth, others which are intended to be deceptive. Sorting through all these different kinds of information is just very, very difficult. 
It's made more complicated by the very human need to try and make sense of the situation that people find themselves in when faced with uncertainty and risk to, to life, to one's family, to one's home. Uh, the, the challenges of trying to navigate a space like that lead people to want to try and make sense of the environment, the very incomplete information environment because having a better understanding of what's going on, even if it is based on incomplete information, can provide a sense of control, perhaps a sense of, if not ease, at least a greater sense of feeling like you know how to navigate through the space. And also people feel a need to communicate to the outside world exactly what they are seeing, what is happening and what are they facing. In these situations, we know that uh, rumors are, uh, are often seen as a, a way of creating what has been called improvised news. People are using the, the incomplete picture that they have on the ground, the things that they can speculate about, the things that they've heard from others without secure sources of uh, evidence, but that they can put together to try and make an explanation. And this sort of constructing of an explanation becomes a sort of uh, alternative to an official narrative or a more reliable source of news. We also know that misinformation becomes a problem in these environments, and it's not necessarily intentional. It is very easy for journalists and individuals on the ground trying to correctly capture what's happening and represent what they're seeing to make mistakes. When uh, a missile strikes a hospital and a uh, the New York Times covered it and has already published a, a, a an editor's note saying we weren't careful enough in how we reported on this and we may have left readers with it, an inaccurate impression. On top of these uh, honest mistakes, we also have challenges having to do with disinformation. I'll say more about this in a minute, but there are, there are powerful incentives for people to want to misrepresent facts in ways that help them advance their own interests. Other scholars have created uh, these uh, a continuum on which we can understand uh, misinformation and disinformation. On one end of the continuum, we have the, the kinds of inaccurate claims that aren't meant to be harmful at all. They are, for example, like satire, intended to be funny, to, to make a political point, to try and convey a novel kind of understanding of, a, of an important problem. And at the other extreme, we have content that is completely false, designed to, to deceive and to cause harm. Is in, in, in the US in the last uh, decade, we've seen a lot of uh, misinformation over on the, the left side of this chart. In this conflict, we're starting to see things sliding over farther to the right. So for example, we're already seeing examples of this notion of false context where people are sharing real content, but misrepresenting what it shows. So showing footage saying, this is footage of an attack when in fact, we you look at the timestamp on the footage, it can't have been from that attack. Or uh, saying, here is a post that someone put on social media when that post was created, but not by the source that it was attributed to. Or actually altering the transcriptions alongside of videos, making claims that are not what is being said in the video, and then sharing those distorted or those altered videos in ways to try and promote a, a false read of the situation. Very briefly, what, why does misinformation exist? I would say that we need to think both about the, the demand and the supply side. That is, on the supply side, why do people create it? On the demand side, why do people consume it? Well, on the supply side, it can be uh, somewhat oversimplified, but we can think of it in terms of three Ps power, passion, and profit, people can use the information environment to try and promote their political agenda, to try and increase their ability to uh, advance their own interests. Passion has to do with the idea that both that people will sometimes say, well, the ends justify the means. It's okay for me to distort the truth because in the end, I, my goals are legitimate, but also because all humans exhibit a tendency to believe claims that are good for them even when they aren't true. And profit in an era of social media monetization of uh, attention, 
the claims that generate a lot of attention can generate income for those who create it. And this has proven, at least in the US in the last several years, to be a powerful incentive for people to share false content, simply to make money. On the demand side, as I've already alluded to, in a crisis, in a conflict, when there's uncertainty and danger, people want to try and understand. Understanding promises control, and control promises at least a temporary fleeting sense of safety. And uh, thus, looking to misinformation, which often promises to provide explanations for things that are hard to understand, complex, and, and uh, promises to give you some insights to how perhaps to keep yourself safe. You can see why people would be drawn to this kind of content. Right, I promise this would be quick. Things that you can do to try and guard against misperceptions yourself. Well, there are just a few strategies that I would offer. First, read widely. Many of us have been trained to read deeply and deep reading is great, but in a context like this, it turns out that most evidence suggests that reading broadly, looking at a variety of sources and comparing across those sources is a key to being, a, uh, being effective at avoiding misperceptions. Also pay attention to sources. I know that all of you know to be skeptical of first person accounts on social media. Well, and also third person accounts on social media. Be skeptical of what you see on social media. This is already being done. We know this. Lots of empirical work shows that people are very skeptical of what they see on social media. But in this situation, it's important to remember how important that is. Also, if you are encountering sources that you've never heard of, look them up. Try and get a sense of where they're coming from. I've noted a couple here, Media Bias Fact Check and the NewsGuard plugin, which is built into Microsoft's Edge browser. These are tools that will allow you to fairly easily get a sense of whether an outlet has a strong or weaker political agenda. Understanding where an outlet is coming from is different than ignoring it. Knowing where it's coming from can give you some insight into the perspectives being represented in the news you're seeing. And thirdly, I would say, watch your emotions. If you see a, con a piece of content that makes you feel immediately angry or heartbroken, be cautious because there are bad actors who exploit powerful emotions to get us to ignore our skepticism, to pay attention, either because that attention will generate money for them or because it will make us more likely to share content that we haven't thought about carefully, that we haven't carefully vetted with others hoping to promote the impact of their messaging. The last thing I would leave you with is that if you see misinformation, if you see a claim that you know is wrong, it's important to speak up. You don't, you, you need to be respectful. You don't need to make fun of someone. You don't need to vilify them. You need to use sources, but you need to speak up. It's not that you should expect to be able to convince the speaker or the person who posted the content. You probably won't. In many cases, you won't. But we have strong empirical evidence that corrections make a real difference. They almost never backfire. They aren't always hugely persuasive, but they have a variety of kinds of effects. They're likely to change some people's minds. And perhaps more importantly, in the social media context, when people post corrections, we see that engagement with the corrected content drops suddenly. These kinds of small interventions can make a huge difference. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Garrett. Uh, well, thank you to all of our speakers. Of course, we have many questions and very little time left. Many of the questions have, I think, been addressed implicitly by our speakers on the way, but I'm going to take two questions for us to end up with, and I'll direct them to specific speakers. One question of information and one question about where we go from here. So several questions have pointed out that there is an asymmetrical um, that part of the asymmetry of the situation is the weight of U.S. support for Israel in funding, in emotional support, as Chris Jelpe pointed out, in public opinion, but also, as one questioner mentioned, in President Biden's extreme, intuitive, empathetic um, positioning of the U.S. with Israel in a way that members of his own, you know, State Department certainly think is going too far. Um, but this kind of strength and the media coverage that goes along with it, the use of UN vetoes, 
Um, I'd like to ask Peter Hahn perhaps just to say a little bit about this UN, this uh, US support, both in relation to Israel and in terms of the larger diplomatic concerns in the Middle East at the moment, the larger peace building process in the Abraham Accords and uh, in relation to Iran. Another. Uh, sure, I, I'll be happy to address that question. Historically speaking, US support for Israel has been very strong and bipartisan. That is deeply rooted in culture, including um, a feeling of religious affinity between Americans and Israelis. America has typically traditionally been considered a Christian nation, and many Christians look upon Israel as a nation of Jews who, with whom they feel some affiliation on theological grounds. In recent decades, evangelical Christians have taken a very strong pro-Israel point of view, largely for religious reasons, and have pressured the U.S. government accordingly. Um, there is also a sense of security partnership with Israel in that Israel appears from the American perspective to be a democratic pro-Western state uh, arrayed against America's enemies or adversaries in the Middle East. There's significant strategic cooperation between the U.S. military and the Israeli military arrayed against the common adversary in Iran. Um, and those factors must be weighing on President Biden's mind as well. The U.S. government stockpiles munitions in Israel for use by American forces in the event of a crisis in the region. Um, and U.S. officers and Israeli officers engage in a lot of, of common planning about how to deal with shared security risks around the region. Around the region. Now, with regard to Arab-Israeli or Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking, most American presidents since the late 1900s pursued a degree of even-handedness, meaning they did try in good faith to reach a two-state solution that would recognize Palestinian interests and independence. Um, that changed dramatically under President Trump, who shed the uh, feeling of even-handedness that had dominated his predecessors and engaged in a series of policy decisions that were ardently pro-Israel and thereby encouraged and authorized and blessed Netanyahu and other Israeli conservatives as they became more aggressive toward the Palestinians. Um, to a certain degree, that boxed in President Biden. He has retreated in some ways from the over commitment to Israel that his predecessor made, but he has not retreated in all ways from uh, where President Trump led. Uh, the Abraham Accords, to address the final part of the question, those were a series of peace agreements between Israel and Arab powers that had never been belligerent toward Israel. They had never been at war with Israel, but they were agreements to recognize peaceful relations and engage in peaceable economic interaction. Uh, the goal of the Trump administration, which launched them, and the Biden administration, which continued them, was to create a region-wide peace apparatus that would be useful for stabilizing the region and arraying its resources against Iran. The goal of Trump and Biden was to enlist Saudi Arabia. That would be the grand prize of all if Saudi Arabia would sign an Abraham Accord and agree to live peacefully in the neighborhood with Israel. Saudi Arabia has never been at war with Israel, but it has been a chief antagonist on the political front. Both Saudi Arabia and Israel are deeply suspicious of Iran, so the U.S. tried to nurture a partnership between them against their common adversary in Tehran. Um, and Biden was, uh, by all accounts, trying to clinch that deal that, uh, mm -hmm. that President Trump had also tried to clinch. Um, there's some evidence, or at least ground for understanding that Hamas's attack of earlier this month was designed to disrupt those peace negotiations and draw the attention of the world back to the Palestinian tragedy, back to the Palestinian predicament, and prevent Saudi Arabia from, quote unquote, selling out the pan-Arab cause uh, on behalf of Israel. Thank you.
Um, finally, we're going to take a question that relates to the position of students, uh, to the position of our audience, and I'm going to ask Joy McCorriston to address this. Somebody asks, how do you support your Israeli American and your Palestinian American peers when you don't feel qualified to spread awareness or make statements on social media? What do you do? Well, hello to all of you in the webinar um, participating. Congratulations for being here, for spending this time um, to be engaged. And I guess I would like to lead in answering this question with saying this is support. You will have a lifetime ahead of you. Uh, listen, read, learn, learn from multiple voices. Um, and although we've heard that you shouldn't make a commitment to read deep, um, I would say you should make a commitment to learn deep. Remember the moments, the, you know, these singular searing events, and mm -hmm. at the same time, follow longer than the news cycle. Acknowledge that this, in the moment, that this is significant to your peers. Be there for them. Perhaps social media isn't the place to do that if you're not informed enough to forward a text or forward um, a, a repost something without knowing about the sources. But acknowledge that this is significant to your peers and that your commitment to learning about it is support for them um, and that you can be supportive in that way. So there are going to be more opportunities on campus. There are courses there are um, knowledgeable faculty, knowledgeable peers, and, and just stay involved. Thank you. Thank you everyone again for coming. I want to say just a word about next steps. Let me say again, for those who may have checked in late, that this was intended to be just a background conversation that might help inexperienced audiences to make sense of the other conversations that are happening and to begin entering into conversations of your own. And this had the special character of an academic conversation. And in my view, at least, that's different from a public conversation. We don't, or at least we shouldn't be representing any authority or any constituency beyond ourselves. What our responsibility is, I think, is to be a resource for everybody. And you do right to hold us to account for that. So Professor McCorriston mentioned courses, mentioned faculty as a resource. The sponsors of this event, as well as other academic units on campus, are working now on follow-up events to this one. And these might be for different audiences at different scales, where there's more time to address complexity or even just grieve and process, and where other sets of voices might be foregrounded. So many of the most urgent and complex questions you had today, the ethical questions, were postponed. And these will be a starting point for our thinking about next steps. But please also feel free to get in touch with me or the leaders of other sponsoring units with your ideas about what you would like to see happen. Thank you all again for coming today. And please, thanks to our speakers. And please, all of you, take care.